Okay, well, welcome everybody to the third lecture in this course. Um, so I hope you had a good weekend. So we uh, discussed Fermi liquid theory in the first two lectures. Uh, we've also had a couple of discussion, discussion sections. Hello? Can you hear me? Everything okay? All right. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of discussion sessions on Fermi liquid theory. Uh, the discussion sessions now are 9 a.m., uh, the day after each lecture. So there'll be one tomorrow, too. And I hope uh, not just the people in different time zone, but if uh, you know, others also try to attend, uh, they've actually been quite uh, quite good. <laughs> Lots of questions and interesting discussions. Um, also, in the sections, uh, how you has uh, covered uh, path integrals so far, uh, how to do the path integral for bosons. Uh, using coherent states, and then path integral for fermions using uh, uh, Grassmann numbers. Now, in principle, you know the path integral method is completely equivalent to the operator method that you may be more familiar with, uh, and uh, we'll try to do things more in the operator language. But there are certain things that are easier to see. Uh, in the path integral language, um, as we'll see maybe even today, uh, where you know what what often happens is that you start out with a certain set of operators, a certain you know in this case you start out with electrons in a Fermi liquid, uh, but at the end of the day when you're done and try to understand the many-body phase, the actual excitations are some other particles, and so how do you go from one set of particles to the other? That's something that the path integral method is really powerful way of doing so anyway okay so we're going to talk about the weakly interacting Bose gas today uh, but before I start uh, if there's any questions uh, please speak up okay so I'm going to start broadcast my screen okay you should be seeing my iPad now uh, yes, so hopefully you all can all see my writing there on the weekly interacting Bose gas. Okay, so we're talking about uh, bosons now with the kinetic energy, say, h bar squared, k squared over 2m, and some short range repulsive interaction, uh, u0. Okay, uh, and then from the second quantization method, which I presume you're all familiar with, uh, you can rewrite it in second contest form here. Uh, where EK would be just h bar squared k squared over 2m. So this is the kinetic energy of the bosons, uh, and this is the weak uh, repulsive interaction uh, assumed to be Q independent. Q is the momentum transfer. Uh, so you imagine you have a boson momentum k and a momentum k prime. They scatter off each other to give you a boson momentum k prime minus Q and k plus Q. Okay. Now you've all presumably seen uh, the weak, the non-interacting Bose gas in your StackMec course. And what you learn there is that uh, as you lower the temperature of the non-interacting Bose gas, there's a Bose-Einstein transition to a state where uh, all the bosons, there are a macroscopic number of bosons in the zero momentum state or the lowest energy state. Um, and that will not be strictly true uh, with interactions, but it will be almost true because you're gonna assume the interactions are weak. Uh, so let's just see how that works out with interaction. So we'll, we'll talk about right now just the ground state. So for the non-interacting gas, the ground state is just put all the bosons at zero momentum. Uh, zero here is the vacuum state. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it turns out much more convenient to, to think about the system in the grand canonical ensemble uh, at some chemical potential mu. Um, this is not to say that the system is actually coupled to a reservoir or that the boson number is not conserved. You could still be talking about a very large box with a fixed number of particles. And as long as the box is large enough, it should make a difference whether you work in the canonical or grand canonical ensemble. Um, this turns out to be quite a, you know, important and subtle issue, when, especially when you have both condensates, uh, but we'll talk about that shortly. But let's just go ahead and think about the grand canonical ensemble where we specify not the number of particles, uh, but the chemical potential. 
So what you want to do in the grand canonical ensemble is you take this quantity, which is H minus mu n, uh, fix mu, and then determine the density to minimize this grand energy, if you want to call it that. So you want some quantum ground state G, which minimizes H minus mu n. Okay, so so let's assume this is the uh, this is our uh, uh, variational ansatz for G, where n naught is now a variational parameter, uh, and we ignore the interactions and we just go ahead uh, and evaluate this. So you will get uh, n naught. Uh, this is just the mu n term. Um, oh, sorry, I'm not ignoring the interaction. Uh, the kinetic energy doesn't contribute because E0 of zero is just zero, so this term disappears. So this is the interaction uh, between the particles. They're all in the same state. Uh, so if you, you can either evaluate this matrix element carefully, starting with putting everything at zero momentum, or you can just see it's, you know, it's an interaction between pairs of particles. So the number of pairs is n times n minus one over two. Uh, the one over v is uh, just a normalization factor that comes from the Fourier transform. Uh, and so that's the exact expectation value of this, of this operator here. You can actually also just, you know, by brute force evaluate this, uh, putting all the momenta to zero. Uh, and then just the boson commutation relation will work out just right. Uh, to give you this minus one factor. Okay, but in fact, the minus one doesn't really matter. I'm just being more precise than I need to be uh, because if you write this in terms of the density, as N zero is the density, total number of particles, zero momentum divided by V, then the whole grand energy is proportional to volume and everything is just a function of the density of order one, everything is of order one, except this term, which is extremely small, which comes from this one. Uh, so you can set that to zero You can ignore that. Uh, and so this is now our grand energy as a function of the variational parameter n naught. So now uh, you minimize this, you get n naught is mu over u. So you notice this is somewhat of a singular limit as uh, u goes to zero, zero, u naught goes to zero, and naught goes to infinity. Uh, so that really tells you that, uh, and the ground state of a free Bose gas where u naught is equal to zero because you have a finite number of particles, a finite density, mu must be zero. And that's something you may remember from your Bose Einstein computation. The chemical potential is pinned to zero at zero temperature uh, in the free Bose gas. But we're considering an interacting Bose gas. And it's actually quite important to consider an interacting Bose gas. So as we'll see in some fundamental sense, the non-interacting Bose gas is not a superfluid, whereas the interacting Bose gas is superfluid. The interactions are really important to understand its superfluidity. Okay, so we're going to always assume U naught is zero, and this is some finite number fixed by mu. All right, so that's uh, with, a, with a rather, you know, simple variational ansatz, you put all the particles in the ground state, in, in the zero momentum state, in the many body ground state. But we want to do better, uh, and you can do that variationally, but a clever way of doing that uh, is the Bogliabov approach. And, and the key idea in the Bogliabov approach is you just think of, since there's so many particles, in the condensate, and n naught is a very large number, 10 to the 23 or something like that. Uh, the, the fact that this is a quantum operator is not important. And we already saw that an example of that here. This minus one was a you know, consequence of the fact that B0 doesn't commute with B0 dagger. That's what led to this minus one here. But it didn't matter. So whether you add a particle to the condensate or remove one particle with condense, this is what we call the condensate, the zero momentum state uh, particles in the condensate, uh, doesn't make any difference. So we just think of B naught as a pure number, square root of N naught. And N naught becomes large, we can ignore the fact that this was a quantum operator. Okay, so we have a, if you wish, a new classical variable emerging here. And that's one of the key 
aspects of the theory of the Bose gas, which we didn't meet in the Fermi gas, uh, that there's a new <clears throat> thermodynamic variable, in which case just the condensate, uh, the number of particles in the condensate, uh, soon we'll actually see it's more convenient to think about a conjugate variable, which is the phase of the condensate, uh, and we'll get to that fairly soon. Okay, uh, and by the phase, I guess I should say right here, uh, let's see, you know, the B naught is a, in general a complex number, the, it could be an e to the i theta here. Uh, we'll just put theta equal to zero for now, but later on, uh, we'll uh, we'll have to worry about this theta. Okay, and it turns out we are the, the key uh, to understanding the properties of a superfluid. All right. So, so what's the idea now? Well, we think of B naught uh, as a very large number. Okay. So if I go back here uh, in this calculation here. Uh, we just assume that every B here was B naught. Okay. Uh, and that was, that is indeed the largest term. But, but for, and for a weekly, weekly interacting gas. But let's go to the next approximation where we keep uh, the next largest term. Now, so the first guess would be to make three of the Bs equal to B naught. Well, that doesn't work because there, if three of them are, uh, uh, at zero momentum, the last one is also at zero momentum. So you can't make three of them equal to uh, B naught. So you can make two of them equal to B naught. You can make, uh, you know, for example, this one and that one equal to B naught. You can make this one and that one, or this one and this one, and this one, that one. So there are four choices for making one B dagger equal to B naught and one B equals to B naught. So if you take those four terms uh, and add them up, what you will get. So these are the terms you already had when you took all four B and put them equal to square root of N naught, B, B, B and put them equal to B naught. Then if you take one B dagger and one B here and put it equal to B naught, if say these two, then these two are left over. And that will just give you a B dagger K, B K, because if both of these are equal to zero momentum, K prime is zero, and Q is zero. So Q is zero, this is also zero. So it just becomes B dagger K, B K, and so on. So if you count all of that, uh, you, you get rid of a factor of two, you get terms over here, and two more terms here, which I've just chosen to write in a slightly different way. Since K is summed over, it doesn't make a difference. <clears throat> so what we are seeing here, roughly speaking, so far is that the interaction u naught um, makes the chemical potential uh, because this just looks like a constant. And so do these uh, these two terms here. But okay, but the the real interesting part of this are these terms, the so-called anomalous terms that were first identified by Bogliubov. What are those terms? Well, those are kind of strange terms uh, because which only appear when you start thinking about B zero as just some uh, complex number. So if you put these two equal to B naught, K and K prime equal to zero, well then Q is not zero. So you just get B dagger Q, B dagger of minus Q. Uh, and we got to keep that term too by the logic uh, of keeping terms of order with two powers of B zero. And so that's the term over here. And this is the term over here. So this is a, a bizarre term. So because it, first of all, it does conserve momentum. So for example, this term annihilates two particles, uh, k and minus k, and uh, so the total momentum is still zero. But it doesn't seem to conserve particle number. So, and how is that possible? Well, it's we never had such terms, at least so far, in the theory of the Fermi gas. So why is this allowed? Well, this is allowed because you have this large condensate sitting there. And what's really happened, you think of this term as the condensate emitting two bosons. Okay, so you have some condensate sitting here. Uh, you know, here's your, here's your condensate with N zero particles. And it emits, well, this term here, 
this one here uh, emits two particles. One particle comes out of the condensate. So there'll be a K and minus K. And this goes to N zero minus two. So if you're keeping track of everything, we have to keep track of the fact that the condensate is not N zero, but N zero minus two. But we, we choose not to because it doesn't matter. You know, it's 10 to the 23 or 10 to the 23 minus two. In the end, you're going to divide by the volume to get something that's about a one. This will be totally negligible. Uh, and that's really the key, the key thing to keep in mind. We're not destroying particle conservation number, uh, but we're just dropping terms like this term, that this one over here. All right, um, so this then, so after you keep terms to next order in the condensate uh, density, um, then this is the Hamiltonian. Okay. And all other terms are higher order in the condensate density uh, and uh, sorry, lower, yeah, have fewer powers of condensate density and therefore are, are not important for weak interactions. Uh, so this particular Hamiltonian, sometimes called the Bogilyubov Hamiltonian, uh, and, and this is our theory of the in weakly interacting Bose gas. Uh, so what do we see here? Uh, well, it's got these two anomalous terms, of course. That's the that's the tricky part about it. These two terms here. Uh, but what's nice about it, it's still quadratic. It doesn't have four powers of b anywhere, uh, and therefore uh, there's a hope that you can solve it exactly. That you can find the ground state uh, and all correlation functions and everything of this uh, interacting Bose of this Bose Hamiltonian exactly. <laughs> And in fact, you can't. Uh, if you think in terms of uh, harmonic oscillators, uh, you know you could think of V dagger B as a harmonic oscillator each moment of K. Uh, this term is something like a, <clears throat> you know P squared plus X squared for a harmonic oscillator if you write it in those coordinates. And if you did that here, these two terms, uh, if you write them out in terms of P and X from undergraduate quantum. Uh, you'll find that these terms induce a cross term. They have things like B, P times X and X times P and so on. So if you're faced with a harmonic oscillator where you have these P and X terms, what do you do in classical mechanics? Well, what you do is a canonical transformation. You introduce new P's and X's uh, so that the Hamiltonian has the canonical form for harmonic oscillators, which is P nu squared plus X nu squared. So here we're going to do, there's a quantum analog of that for quantum operators, and that's the Bogolyubov transformation. So it's also a canonical transformation uh, of these uh, boson creation and annihilation operators. So the canonical transformation, uh, you introduce a new boson, which we call eta k, and we'll see what eta k is in a minute. So it's some other Bose operator for each moment of k. <laughs> Uh, and you want to make this always have this form, you know, eta dagger eta. So, so you make your uh, eta, your B, a linear combination of eta and eta dagger. Just assert, I'm going to write it this way. And why do I put a minus k here? Well, that's, I want to conserve momentum. So if I'm going to remove a particle momentum k, at least as far as momentum is concerned, that should be the same as adding a particle with momentum minus k. And of course you can take k to minus k and then you get this. And then the coefficients I'm going to call cosh theta k and sin minus sin theta k. Why am I calling them that? Well, just to make life simpler later on, but this is just some, some real number which I need to determine. Okay. So first of all, why do I call them cosh and cinch? Well, that's because what I want to do, of course, is to make this new operator also a boson. Or conversely, if eta is a boson, B should be a boson, canonical boson. This means that if I have this representation and I assume that, uh, you know, that, oops. Uh, if I that given 
uh, eta k eta dagger of k prime commutator is delta of k k prime, uh, then then you find that you correctly satisfy v k v k dagger. So if you take the commutator of this with itself, you get a you know eta with eta dagger, you get a cosh squared of theta k. Here you get eta dagger with eta, which gives you a minus one. That's why we, you know, we had the cinch here, because then you end up getting minus cinch squared. Uh, and, and now, of course, now you see why we call it cosh and cinch, because cosh squared minus cinch squared is one. Uh, and so eta is a boson, and b is a boson, and you can also invert the relation and verify that's the case. So right now, theta can be anything. Eta is a good good boson. So what do you do next is you take this uh, decomposition and insert it in here uh, and collect all the terms. And, and when you collect all the, yes, question. Sorry, can I can I ask, um, I might have missed it, but why does the B dagger K BK show up um, twice the you, in the, the Hamiltonian you wrote to quadratic order? Like this one? Um, yeah, so you have a u naught n naught term in the second line, um, and also in the third line of that Hamiltonian. I might have missed it, but why is it there twice? You mean this term and this term? Um, yeah, and they're also in the, the second line, um, I believe. Yeah, so yeah. This, this is just for convenience. If you wish, you can take these two terms and absorb it there uh, and put a factor of two in front of this. You can do that if you wish. It's just that when you do these rotations, uh, it's very nice to write it this way. The whole thing simplifies, looks a little better. That's all. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, I, I've just, this is just for, you know, you can equally well put it there. It's just, okay. It turns out that these these terms, you know, they're kind of a nice symmetric form. So when you do this rotation, they, they kind of map onto each other in a nice way. And also another thing that's very useful is that mu, you know, if you look at the value of n naught, which we had here, uh, it's mu over u. So what will happen is that this term will exactly cancel this term. And, and that's also very useful as you'll see in a minute. <laughs> so this is just for convenience that I separated it out. You don't have to. You, will, you weren't asking about this way, your BB, that, that you get. Were you asking about this term? No, no, that was, that no. was it. Okay, great, okay. All right, so now I make the substitution of this uh, rotation, this canonical transformation in here, uh, expand. And of course, you choose your theta so that the new Hamiltonian in terms of H looks very simple. Uh, and that turns out to be uh, the case that uh, that's the simple, that the eta eta terms uh, are vanish if you choose this equation. So that's a bit of algebra I'm not going through here. Uh, you have to, this fixes the value of theta uh, is equal to this quantity here. And then uh, you uh, substitute the value of theta back in uh, and see what this, this whole thing looks like. Keeping track of everything, not dropping anything so after again, a, a somewhat SE algebra, uh, this is what you get. So this is the new form of the Bagilibov Hamiltonian. Uh, okay. And, and also we use this fact uh, that N naught uh, is mu over U. So we have, uh, okay. And uh, what is mu zero? That must be a typo that's pro. Or is it U zero or? Uh, I think that's supposed to be u0, I'm pretty sure. Uh, okay, I can't erase it. So I can, of course that's written in the PDF file, I can, uh, there, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so this is the old ground state energy that we had before. This This term here, this thing, is precisely um, the minimum value of that. If you put n not equal to this and plug it in here, uh, you'll get this ground state grand energy, if you wish. Okay, it's negative. 
uh, even though the interactions are repulsive. That's because you're because of this minus mu n term. And then there's a correction. This is another constant. So this is the first correction uh, to the ground state energy due to interaction due for a weakly interacting Bose gas. Uh, okay, this is just some number, some integral you have to evaluate, uh, which is first uh, determined by Bogolyubov, and then there was also some work by Yang and Lee where they even got the next term. Uh, but for us, the most important term uh, is this. So just eta dagger eta sum on k. Beautiful. So just a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And ek, ek, well, ek is the excitation energy, uh, which is, turns out to equal this. Uh, okay, it's ek squared, the, the old ek squared, which is h bar squared k squared over 2m, plus 2u naught n naught ek. So what do we claim? What now the idea of, so what we say then, eta k is the quasi particle. So our quasi particle, which is an excitation of the condensate uh, is this eta particle. It's a boson and has energy EK, which is not the same as the bare energy of the boson, but it's some renormalized energy. And here's a renormalized formula. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, and EK is of course always positive and it also has some other remarkable features that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, what else was I going to say? You know, I think that's that's it. So this is the, ex, the set of excitations of this interacting pose gas are these quasi particles. Oh yeah, what I was going to say, what is this quasi particle eta k? How does it relate to the underlying boson? Well, you can just go back here. Of course, the inverse of this will tell you roughly speaking that uh, you can invert this equation that eta k is something like uh, BK with some constant and B dagger of minus K. So this quasi particle uh, is a linear combination, loosely speaking, of a boson and a hole, of a particle and a hole. So it's, uh, what is it, more formally, what does it mean? It means that if you create a quasi particle, so you add a, you know, you add a boson, well, that boson will propagate but every now and then uh, it'll find a partner and disappear into the condensate and that partner will leave a hole. So it's, that's why it's, because the condensate is there to give, to give and remove particles in pairs anytime you want uh, by the inverse of this process uh, here, uh, you can take a linear combination of particle in a hole. And that's, that, so as your particle is moving around, it's it's interacting with the condensate and the other particles and, and the appropriate excitation is a linear combination. The quasi particle is a linear combination of a partner. So that's a, quite a non-trivial result that comes out of this Bogleybaugh theory. Okay, another remarkable feature which we're going to understand better uh, is about this energy. So let's plot this energy where EK, and we're gonna take EK uh, is K squared over two M. So if you take EK is H bar squared K squared over two M, then this is what it looks like. So when K is very small, uh, this term is negligible compared to this. This vanishes as K squared. You take a square root, it vanishes linearly. On the other hand, when K is very large or U naught is very small, uh, then this disappears, this is not important, and it just becomes k squared over 2m. So at large momentum, compared to the interaction strength and the density, so this is some energy scale, the interaction strength times the density, that's the small parameter in our problem that we have assumed is the case. At momenta larger, energy scales larger than the interaction energy scale, uh, it's as if there's no condensate, you just have the bare particle dispersion. So at high momenta, at short distances, the particle is moving around on their own. And this is in fact, all you see in the free Bose gas theory, you only see the, the bare particle mode. But at very low energies, you see something that disperses linearly. 
So, so we have this liquid now of bosons, which is, has a mode and excitation, a harmonic excitation that disperses linearly. Well, if you take an ordinary liquid, uh, that also has an excitation that disperses linearly, and we call that sound. So this is a sound mode, uh, sometimes it's called second sound. It's very different from ordinary sound. Ordinary sound uh, is more of a hydrodynamic mode, uh, meaning that, you know, if you take a, the gas in this room or something, it's, pro you know, sound is propagating through the gas, and the way it propagates is by many, many collisions uh, between, uh, uh, between the, uh, the, the molecules of the gas, and many, many collisions took place much, very fast to allow the pressure wave to propagate. Uh, and you know, and that gives you allows you a way to you have to take a hydrodynamic theory with many collisions to figure out this, the sound velocity. Uh, so that sound is normally called sometimes called first sound, and this is sometimes called second sound. Uh, this is really second sound. It's really it's very different from first sound because it's not a hydrodynamic uh, excitation like in liquids or gases. This is really a superfluid, and it's really a better way to think about it is as it's it's, uh, it's an elementary excitation. It's just a single excitation. Nothing is colliding with anything. It's a coherent excitation. It's a particle wave, and in that sense, it's more like sound in a solid. A sound, a solid also has sound, which are phonon, which are just harmonic waves of lattice vibrations. Those are collisionless. They propagate long distances without any enharmonicities having any effect. Uh, so second sound is more like sound in a solid, not like sound in a liquid, but it's something that appears in a superfluid. Okay, so one feature of sound uh, that we like to believe any sound mode has uh, is that its dispersion is linear in K. And first of all, vanishes uh, as K goes to zero. So EK, so, so the excitation energy EK over K, uh, limit k goes to zero is not equal to zero and is what we call the sound velocity, second sound velocity. Not equal to, sorry, <laughs> didn't write that properly. Uh, this is what we call c and it's greater than zero. Okay. Sorry, question? Yes. Um, is there any way to tell apart like these second sound modes and these first sound modes? Sure. Uh, you know, you have to look at their damping. The temperature depends on the damping or the dispersion as a function of frequency. And also, it turns out the second sound mode doesn't carry any heat, whereas uh, you can have a linear combination of uh, heat and density fluctuations in ordinary sound. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's a. But this, yeah, I don't want to get into hydrodynamic mode that some ways is more complicated. This is really, just think of it as a, the analog of a phonon it's a, in a solid. It's just a harmonic mode of liquid. It's very different, okay. however, from sound in liquid. It's more like sound in a solid. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, all right, but what we like any sound mode to uh, to display is first of all this feature, which means that the energy must vanish as k goes to zero. And why did that happen here? Well, if you go back and work this through, and this goes back to Main's question, it vanished because, uh, precisely because uh, when you did this algebra, which I urge you to go through, uh, this term canceled with that term. And that canceled with this term only because you put in the value uh, this. So it was very important to take, to really do a theory which is probably under control at big density uh, to see this and to see this energy vanishing. Okay. Now, so what we know, of course, today, and we'll see some, some reasons for that later, this is a very generic property. This is not a property uh, just of this weak, weakly interacting Bose gas. This is a property even a strongly interacting Bose gas. Uh, and it's best understood in terms of phase fluctuation of the condensate and the idea of broken symmetry. So there's a broken symmetry here, which we'll talk about in the, certainly by next week, if not, uh, yeah. I want to do BCS theory first and then do broken symmetry. So there's a broken symmetry 
and this in that context this would be sometimes called a goldstone mode uh, it's uh, it's something associated uh, with uh, broken symmetry associated with particle number uh, but not that we're not violating conservation of particle number it's just that the condensate picks a phase I mean, yeah so let me i can say that now and we'll see that in more detail fairly shortly there is this phase here uh, which uh, which i ignored i mean you can do the whole theory and put in a complex phase and it won't change anything uh, all of this will exactly be the same uh, certainly the ek will not depend on the phase uh, and it turns out that you can another interpretation at long wavelengths. So, you know, what is the proper interpretation of this quasi particle? At high momenta, it's just the bare particle, as the bare particle display. At very low momenta, uh, the proper interpretation of this quasi particles turns out to be uh, oscillations of this phase. It's the oscillations of this phase uh, that gives you uh, the phonon or the second sound mode. Uh, and why that is, and that's something the path integral language will make clear, as we'll just talk about, uh, if not today, uh, certainly in the next lecture. So, and then once you recognize that that the what the phonon mode is just oscillations of the condensate, uh, then it becomes very easy to see why the energy must vanish as uh, as k goes to zero, uh, because the energy can only depend on gradients of the phase. And the gradients of the phase, every time it is gradient, you pick up a factor of momentum. It's very similar to why does the energy of a sound made on a solid vanish? In a solid, you break translational symmetry. And so if you have some distortion, the energy can only depend on the gradients of the distortion. And so here it's a very similar argument, but it requires you to talk about this quantum phase here. So it's this quantum phase of the condensate becomes like a classical variable at long home, long distances, and gives you this sound mode in the superfluid. Okay, any questions on uh, that? We're going to see that one more time in the path integral language where this connection between the sound mode and the phase fluctuation become much clearer. Hi, Sabir. So, so here in, the, in, in, in this setup, the the EK is linear in K, but it basically depends on the fact that your 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 free particle di 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 dispersion is K square. So um, yes, that's correct. Is this uh, is this like to to fine tune? For example, if I consider some other kind kind of free particles. Well, um, yeah. So if you, if you have some other kind of free particles. So I mean, locality basically simply says, even, you know, suppose I took some more complicated boson in some optical lattice, uh, will I always get a K squared dispersion? I think you will because locality, uh, anything other than K squared requires you to have long range hopping or something. I see. And if you have hopping or some long range uh, terms, yes, then the phonon doesn't disperse as uh, linearly in K. So yeah, it does require K squared here. But that's quite generic for any any system, not just free bosons. It's also true for any systems, uh, even in lattices, provided the hopping is short range. I see. Uh, so last week we kind of talked about uh, quasi particles as particles surrounded by a cloud of virtual particles. Yeah. How does this uh, reflect that interpretation of them? Yeah, I mean, here it's, it's, it's the cloud we already know. Here we actually know the cloud. We can do a bit better. It's like a particle plus, uh, well, or, yeah, it's a particle plus a hole with two particles gone from the condensate, something like that. So it's, it's, it's the particle moving around and it's constantly oscillating back and forth into the condensate and out of the condensate. So you can, yeah, if you want to, write down an actual wave function for the underlying bosons. I think you can do that with the Bogolyubov theory and, and, and you get some kind of uh, backflow around, you have a particle and there's a backflow around it. You can kind of interpret it that way. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Chuvan. Can I speak? Yes, please, go ahead, Chuvan. 
do we sorry naive question do we get more some modes if there are some additional modification of Hamiltonians and the second question is that is a sum mode always has a, have a linear dispersion relation uh, I'm not sure yeah the answer to both your questions is yes uh, and the linear dispersion argument I just gave you it just depends on locality of the boson Hamiltonian uh, the yes. And do you always get the sound mode? Yes, and for that, to really understand why, you have to really think a little bit about symmetry breaking, which I'm going to do in, in, a, in a, I think, in a, in a short while. In the Pythagorean language, it becomes completely clear. So just wait a few minutes. Well, they, before we go to, before well, we go to Pat, sorry, go ahead. Uh, both answers are yes, so there could be also higher sound, sound modes. You, you say also- oh, Maybe I don't know, I, maybe I misunderstood your question. I'm just saying there's one sound mode in every bulk super every bulk superfluid. Yes. Uh, uh, I say that uh, if we add uh, or modify the Hamiltonian, maybe adding yeah. actions, could we get the additional different different modes also like some mode maybe high, higher modes? This might be very. Uh, you, you can get other modes, but they won't vanish at k goes to zero. So generally, only one mode is required to vanish as k goes to zero. Everything else is fine-tuned. If you get more than one vanishing as k goes to zero, that would be fine-tuning. But you can certainly have other modes or other quasi-particles in, you know, in different configurations of bosons. Thank you. Okay, so, so one thing we can now ask is what is the exactly what we asked for the Fermi gas? <laughs> How is the moment? What is the momentum distribution function? What is the occupation number of bosons in the ground state? Okay, so for k not equal to zero, that's just given by this, uh, and so we just write b and b dagger uh, in terms of eta and eta dagger uh, using this transformation, or actually right there. And when you do hey, that, sorry, can I can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little confused with how to reconcile this with what I think happens for fermions because this, this in, is very different for fermions. Yeah, it's a different yeah. theory. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sure. Yeah, but if if we condense pairs of fermions, then the Bogoliubov quasi particles there are gapped, right? Um, yes. So but, we'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. That's okay. precisely the next chapter. Uh, okay. what, I think I'm just, yeah. yeah, so the Bogolyubov just... quasi-particles, yeah, so those, they, these are two different Bogolyubovs, if you wish, two different papers, they're very different. Mm -hmm. The Bogolyubov quasi-particles you're referring to are fermions, uh, and those fermions so they are not required to have vanishing energy. This is a, mm -hmm. this is a different Bogolyubov, different paper by Bogolyubov, <laughs> uh, and this is a boson. Uh, in the both condensate required to vanish. Now, superconductor that you're thinking of with fermions also has this particular, this boson bug of excitation. Uh, mm -hmm. And normally we don't talk about it because uh, there mm -hmm. it turns out that because of the long range interactions between the electrons, it gets mixed with the plasma and it's not that important. But in a neutral Bose gas, if you had neutral fermions uh, like helium-3, so helium-3 does have, has both kinds of Bogolyubov particles. It has this kind, <laughs> which is the phonon, a sound mode in helium-3 is like a Bogolyubov quasi-particle, the condensate. And it also has the fermionic Bogolyubov quasi-particle. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. We're gonna talk about that soon for others who might be confused. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Point is, uh, I guess I'm yeah. still a little confused because in the fermionic case, we think about the like, this mean field description is having like excitations on top of the condensate and then the ripples of the condensate, it seems like are kind of treated separately. But in this case, yes. it seems like the excitations on top of the condensate are the same as the ripples in the condensate. And I'm having trouble seeing yeah. how to understand so there are, that. Right, so BCS superconductor has two different types of perturbation, two different types of quasi-particles. There's the ripples of the condensate, which are present even in the Bose gas. Uh, 
which you normally don't consider, except in a neutral Fermi gas. Uh, and then there's the fermionic excitations. Now, you know, suppose, yeah, or suppose this boson here was really a molecule. We are talking about a boson, which is just some <laughs> uh, featureless boson, uh, but there's no such thing like, other than the Higgs boson. So this boson in real life is always a molecule of fermions, even number of fermions. So let's imagine it's a bound state of two fermions. Then this particular superfluid has another excitation where you split the molecule into two, two fermions. That's the quasi-particle you're thinking of. That's the fermionic quasi-particle, if this boson was made up of two fermions. So we are ignoring that here. We're assuming the energy of that is infinity. But in a BCS theory, that energy is not infinity, it's quite small. That's, that's, that ultimately is the only difference between a Bose superfluid and a Fermi superfluid. Is that it's just a question of energy. How large is the energy to split the boson into two fermions? I see, thank you. Sure. Okay. All right, so I was going to just compute uh, B dagger B. And of course, the here, the actual ground state is very has a very simple definition. Uh, the ground state has the property uh, that eta k acting on the ground state, if you try to annihilate an excitation, this is equal to zero for k not equal to zero. So because, and the reason that's the case uh, is because this energy here, ek, capital ek is positive. So you don't want any, any uh, excitation in the ground state. Okay, so this is the definition of the ground state itself. And you can even figure out the ground state wave function starting from this. Uh, okay, that might be a homework problem. Remind me how you, okay. <laughs> All right, so now we just, in this ground state G, we evaluate B dagger B, where you write B in terms of eta, you use this rule, uh, and, and, and then you find the only term that can possibly contribute is this. I mean, there's assumed to be a G over here and a G over there. Uh, and this is just one. So it's a sin squared theta K, uh, which you can write in terms of EK, it's this form here. Okay. Okay, and you, now you plot B dagger K, B K. Uh, you see something, uh, what do you see? Uh, well, there's the zero momentum piece which I, that was for k not equal to zero. The zero momentum piece gives you a delta function uh, in the continuum. So there's a delta function at zero momentum. And this thing you can figure out falls as one over k for large k. Okay, so this is, so in the non interacting Bose gas, everything was in the delta function at the ground state at zero momentum. Now there's an above the condensate part, even in the ground state. Uh, and uh, it decays in some power of k as k becomes large. And, and these are actually generic properties of uh, both condensate and helium-4. You can measure all of this. Even though it's a strong, U naught and not, not a small number. Uh, in that case, actually, the number of atoms in the condensate is much smaller uh, than the number outside the condensate. Whereas if you take uh, BECs, you know, alkali uh, atoms, uh, ultra-cold atoms, then the number in the condensate is usually uh, much larger than the number outside the condensate. So we want to contrast this with the free Fermi gas, uh, which had a step function, and okay. And of course, in an interacting Fermi gas in Fermi liquid theory, as we saw, uh, there was still a step here. With, uh, that's all interactions did. So in a, in a Fermi gas, the interaction reduced the size of the step. In a Bose gas, they reduced the number of atoms in the condensate. But the two features survive, even the presence of interactions, which can in principle be arbitrarily strong. So what survives in the Fermi gas is the fact there's a discontinuity in N of K. What survives in the Bose gas is that there's a delta function at zero momentum. So that's, those are statements in momentum space. It's useful to uh, transform those statements into real space. Sorry, this one over k tail is only true for weakly interacting theories? No, it's generally true, I believe, yeah. At large enough k, it's true. Why is that? 
Uh, well, okay, I, I think it just follows from the structure of this. I mean, uh, um, let's, right, so this term at large k becomes one. So the ek over ek gives you cancels the one. Then the next correction, uh, I believe, you know, I, I guess has to be, yeah, you have to expand the k squared and then you'll take a square root. I, I forget. I believe that is the case. But then, like, uh, okay, you... no, 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 no. There's a better way of understanding it. Just wait. Maybe not this lecture. My next lecture will definitely get to it. <laughs> There's a better way of understanding it, uh, coming from uh, effective phase fluctuations. <laughs> Again. <laughs> okay, but let me just preparing for that discussion on phase fluctuations. Uh, let's just take a Fourier transform of these two. Okay. So the Fourier transform uh, of n of k, if you just rewrite this thing in real space, uh, it gives you this. So this is the field operator. This annihilates a particle at point r prime. This creates a particle at point r. So this is the two point correlation function between r prime and r at equal time. Okay, so this is just the Fourier transform of n of k. All right, so if you take the Fourier transform, uh, what you find is this very is that this delta function, which I are which I have asserted is always present in, in any superfluid at zero momentum, uh, implies that there is a term here that's independent. It doesn't depend on r minus r prime. So no matter how far r and r prime get, this goes to there's a non-zero value. Where, however, this part, well, you have to take some complicated Fourier transform. So what you know from, you know, general thing to keep in mind for Fourier transforms, if you take the Fourier transform of some smooth function and of the smooth part of N of K, when R minus R prime is very large, this part will oscillate a lot. So this oscillates very rapidly as a function of K when R minus R prime is large. So since it oscillates very rapidly and this is smooth, any smooth function times a very rapidly oscillating function will give you zero. So as R minus R prime, this, this part doesn't even contribute. So strictly speaking, uh, you have the property here. And this is actually the correct way to define, formal way to define the condensate, uh, which is that limit uh, R minus R prime of psi dagger of R psi of r prime is not equal to zero. And this is what we call uh, as n naught or the condensate number. Okay, so this is sometimes also called off diagonal long range order for historical reasons, uh, because people were thinking in terms of the density matrix. So this, this thing you can think of as a uh, one particle density matrix in the many particle space. But that's not a language we use very much these days. We just say, okay, just the field correlation function, psi dagger psi in the second quantized form. So, you know, if you think of psi, you know, psi, it just removes a particle. Let's think of it as removing from the, from the condensate. So psi removes it uh, and then it adds it back. Uh, and this statement, why we call long range order, because this statement says for this to not vanish, it must be roughly speaking that the phase of the condensate with which you remove a particle at point R prime and then put it back in at point R must be the same. So there's long range order. And what is the long range order in? The long range order uh, is theta. That is theta is the same everywhere in the superfluid or almost the same. It can fluctuate a bit, but it remembers you know, if theta is pointing uh, to three o'clock in one end of the sample, it's also pointing at three o'clock at the other end of the sample. That's the fundamental property of a condensate. Doesn't matter where it points, but it's the same everywhere. And the nice thing about this is that, you know, this is true in any ensemble. It's, it doesn't involve operators that, uh, uh, that violate particle conservation number and so on. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, so this is the fundamental characterization of the superfluid, the broken symmetry in the phase, which gives you this off-diagonal long-range order. Uh, and we'll say much more about that in the next next few lectures. 
we've had to see, examine the consequence of this in many different ways. This is really the crucial property that allows you to understand why it's a superfluid, why a superconductor is a superconductor, why is there a Meissner effect. They all follow from this property. Actually, strictly speaking, this is not necessary. In lower dimensions, like two dimensions at finite temperature, this actually is zero, but you still have, in some sense, a long range order, but it requires a more subtle definition, which we'll also talk about. But for now, let's imagine in three dimensions, then this is required uh, for superfluidity. Uh, for fermions, so let's, what about for fermions? Well, fermions, we can, uh, we can take a Fourier transform of this. Uh, so you take a Fourier transform. Okay, I've done it for you uh, in three dimensions. Uh, so what you find is that this does indeed go to zero as R goes to infinity. Uh, it goes to zero with some power law and with some oscillations. So, you know, it's some kind of uh, oscillation. So here, if you plot this as a function of R, you know, it's some decaying oscillations. Decaying is one over R cubed. But the oscillations, however, are, are important. Uh, they occur at a distance, which is one over KF. That's the wavelength of the oscillations. So what happens in a Fermi gas is there's no off type in a long range order, uh, but there are these, oh no, why isn't this writing, one over KF? There are these things which are sometimes called Friedel oscillations. There are oscillations in, the, in this quantity and other quantities too because of the presence of discontinuity. So this discontinuity uh, at the Fermi surface introduces oscillations. Uh, and that's the fermionic, you know, long range rigidity of the wave function. The fact that there was this discontinuity gives you these oscillations. Uh, but boson that's simpler it just goes to a non-zero value. So in this case, if you plot psi of r, you know it, it just decays to some value like that. This is r. This value is n naught. Okay. Oh, well, I'm out of time. All right. So the next lecture will be re-derivation of all the same things, but using path integrals. Uh, and then you will see very clearly uh, the importance of symmetry in the path integral approach. Okay, questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, for the case of the, I guess, the Fermi uh, distribution at like finite temperature when it's smeared, um, yes. will it still um, I mean, there there will still be no um, like order there. Like the correlator will go to zero as R and R prime are separated, even if it's like yeah. smeared. Yeah. So, but if you if you have if you <coughs> uh, at finite temperature, I, I am the right factor. There's an exponential factor. It's something like exponential minus T R over V F. R, I think something. Yeah, H, yeah, that's dimensionally correct. Uh, maybe the factor of pi. Yeah, so what happens at these Friedel oscillations um, uh, get exponentially damped. So at, at zero temperature, they decay with the power law. At finite temperature, they have an exponential decay. So that's because, as you just said, this discontinuity is no longer discontinuity. N of k is just a smooth function. On the other hand, for bosons, that's not true. This off time the long range order can survive even at finite temperature, uh, at least in three dimensions. Uh, and so the fact that this is true, it doesn't require zero temperature. It's actually true at all temperatures below, uh, below the critical temperature, T less than T critical. Whereas for a Fermi gas, it's, it's much more, it's more fragile. Uh, these oscillations get exponentially damped at any non-zero temperature. Okay, thank you. There was some signature uh, at when Z goes to zero in the fermionic theory that like conceivably like, I don't know if this is actually reasonable, but like conceivably have something like a non-Fermi liquid type behavior. Is there some analog for bosons or am I getting everything wrong? Um, I think the analog of Z uh, is just uh, N zero. So you can make N zero quite small uh, in a, like in helium four, 
uh, N0 is about 10% of the density of helium-4. Only 10% of the molecules of the atoms of helium-4 in a superfluid are in the condensate because the interactions are so strong, the repulsion. So we don't have any way of computing things there, uh, except on a computer, which today we can do pretty well. Uh, but there's no such simple theory like this to give you the number 10% from the Hamiltonian of helium-4. We, we know that from measurements and computer calculations. Uh, so you can ask, but well, what happens as the condensate fraction goes to zero? Well, then uh, we're going to ask that. And then you can get you get some other phases of bosons. You can get uh, spin liquids and uh, uh, more insulators and so on. And that's much of the topic. That's, in fact, what we'll talk about. It's a little easier to ask for bosons what happens when N0 goes to zero and then to ask for fermions when Z goes to zero. Uh, and fermions, it's, a, it's more complicated. And we may get to that towards the end of the course. Okay, thanks. And one other thing is one over K yeah. behavior. Um, you, yeah. you said something about the like the fluctuations uh, in, in phase, but like that entire construction um, comes out of this assumption that like N is a very large number. No? Like N. This calculation, yes. But okay, uh, we'll... Uh, when we, we're going to do a more general, more phenomenological theory, some effective field theory, we write on an effective field theory for a superfluid. And that's much nice, easier done in the path integral approach. Uh, and the effective field theory has certain constraints. They just come from symmetry. And you can use those to say a lot about this form of the correlation functions. Yeah, we're getting to that. That's Sorry. the next lecture. <laughs> Great, but good question. Other questions? Um, actually, I had a question. Uh, is there any way of seeing uh, if lambda, uh, lambda rotons can appear uh, in this picture uh, at all? Uh, or do we have to move to some, to some more strongly interacting picture? Yeah, the rotons are more like a, you do a variational calculation. Uh, and, and what you do is you, uh, you relate the excitation spectrum to the structure factor. The structure factor is telling you something about the short distance correlation functions of the Bose liquid. And then you make an assumption that in the superfluid state, the short distance correlations of the atoms are pretty much the same uh, as, the, as an ordinary liquid. Uh, and that's reasonable because what's really special about a superfluid uh, is the presence of the condensate, which is at zero momentum. I mean, you can also see that here, the dispersion is just k squared over 2m at short distances for large momentum. So you make a certain assumption uh, that the short distance structure factor of a superfluid is the same as of an ordinary liquid, which you know from you know, all kinds of other measurements. And then from that, you can get some uh, something like a roton. Roton is really a short distance excitation at finite energy. Uh, it's a little, you know, uh, it's a little ambiguous whether it actually really exists, but it, it for some purposes, a useful way to think about what the spectrum looks like at short distances. Yeah, so there is, so if you have stronger interaction for, you know, sometimes the dispersion doesn't have this very simple form uh, as a function of K for a strongly interacting Bose gas, sometimes there's a little minimum here. And this is sometimes called the roton. And, 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 uh, so yeah, you have, to, it's really something that come, involves a lot of guesses and I don't think there's any controlled calculation that gives it, or you can do numerical calculations to see it. Okay, I see, thank you. Yeah, uh, what's robust uh, of this calculation uh, is first of all, the linear K dependence here and the free K squared at very large K. That's robust. <laughs> Some other fishy things can happen when you have strong interactions in between. Severe, I have a question. Yes. Um, so for the one over K um, decay, yeah, for the I may bosons, have wrong. <laughs> yeah, I should say that. I've been... um, that also, that's for zero temperature, right? Like zero temperature interacting bosons. Yeah. Yes, correct. And I, I may, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure of that. I think there is a, the correct statement that it goes as one over K for a small window of small K, not at large K. There's a window of non zero K here here, where it's one over K, I believe. Uh, 
Okay, um, so, I have to double check that, but we, we'll, we'll see when we get to it, uh, or I it, can make it a homework problem to compute that in general using the using the more general theory of a superfluid that we'll get to soon enough. Is it then correct to say like in zero temperature, um, we fill up the like phonon modes on given a typical chemical potential? Okay, you should not think of this as a phonon mode. This is part of the ground state. So the, okay. the correct picture is that the ground state wave function, you know, looks, uh, the way to think about the, the ground state is that you have some, a whole bunch of bosons, which are sitting in the condensate, which are just sitting there if you wish, they're at zero momentum. And then you have a whole bunch of other bosons, which are, which are coming in and out of the condensate. So you have B and B. So the, 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 the and the condensate is emitting bosons and also emitting bosons. So these are quantum fluctuations of the condensate. And this whole thing, the condensate plus the cloud of bosons being emitted and absorbed, that is the ground state. It's not a phonon, these are the ground state. The excitation is above this, it's kind of orthogonal to this. You have to you end up having to take a linear combination of a particle and a hole to make the wave function of the excitation orthogonal to this uh, linear combination uh, of the condensate and particle of particle particle pairs that are in the ground state. I see. Uh, Thanks. And in fact, you know that that's what. Okay, uh, you can actually work out the full wave function of this thing. Uh, just use this condition. Uh, you know, you just use this equation to write down the ground state of the bosons. And in fact, it's very similar to, you know, something that happens in a shifted harmonic oscillator. If you have a harmonic oscillator and then you shift it, well, there's a new shifted harmonic modes. Then you can ask how many of the original modes are this. Well, there's some wave function for the, for the shifted harmonic oscillator. Uh, what happened? Oh, well, okay, my, I'm sorry, my share screen died, but you could still hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and see my waving hands, yeah. So there's sort of like a shifted harmonic oscillator. I, I, I'm i definitely gonna make a homework problem for that. <laughs> yeah, so we'll I'll work on a homework problem in the next few, next day or so, and uh, that'll be something you can work out. Actually, okay. yeah, probably on Friday, I'll hand out the name of the home bus homework. Because I do want to go through path integrals before we start the homework. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? This is related to a question that I think Patrick asked before, but um, is a statement that like all right, okay. great. So we can continue the discussion tomorrow at uh, nine a.m. and uh, have a good day. <laughs>